Watch this. It's the holiday meant for love, an emotion people have been trying to define and express for thousands of years. But just within the last 100, perhaps nowhere is that feeling illustrated better than in letters home from soldiers. Date night um, allows people to take a break from everything and focus on themselves and the person that they love. So throw out your movie night and dinner plans and roll up your sleeves because date night is about to get dirty. No, not that kind of dirty. Okay, now it's that kind of dirty because believe it or not, Boise did have a red light district. I know it's a day for love, but can Valentine's Day also be a day for lust? Well, apparently that covered a lot of days in Boise's early days. Okay, so one of the unique things about the 208 is sometimes we like to take a day, a whole day, and focus on that day, like MLK Day or Idaho Statehood Day or today, Valentine's Day, the one day I get to wear this coat. And nothing says Valentine's Day quite like a love letter. But putting those feelings into words, it's really not an easy task. And like the love they represent, the good ones stand the test of time. Well, a handful of letters like that ended up in the Warhawk Air Museum in Nampa. And they have a full collection of love stories told through the mail between soldiers and their wives and loved ones back home. But Andrew Bartline shows us is what one soldier took home that's keeping his love story alive. There's something rugged, something tough about the Warhawk Air Museum. War, planes and guns. This time of year? Masculine kind of an environment. There's something different. Honey, how are you? Gee, I had a lump in my throat and wanted to tell you things, but I knew I would have started to cry. I'm going to miss you more than I ever dreamed. I love you. Boy, I feel sort of silly writing it, but I want you to know it. Answer as soon as possible. Always yours, Lefty. Though Doug Rutan says everything's written. They make me emotional. Perfectly right. You kind of, you can, can picture what they're going through. A snapshot in time for men who left a lot unsaid. My dad never talked about it to me, and it wasn't until through the war hawk that he started telling the stories. You think of war and you, you, you have kind of negative thoughts, but there was a lot of love. If they didn't have that support from home, I think it would have made their job a lot harder. Because distance makes the pen. Hello, darling. Grow fonder. I hope you're doing okay. I'm feeling all right. To be with you would make a great improvement, though. I was just staring at our wedding picture and reminiscing those moments. What beautiful memories. Well, darling, let's keep our chins up and may God watch over us both. Love always, your husband, Johnny. P.S. It was swell of you giving blood, but don't be too generous. Their escape captures us today. I just, this guy, this guy's really good. <laughs> but Doug's here. Loving man. For dad. A Leonard Rutan. If he would have been sitting here in my place, he would have had a hard time getting through it. 52 <laughs> years of marriage. After mom died. Leonard wasn't far behind. 2009, he was 92 years old. But today, they're closer than you think. It's representative of a love story, a war love story. One not told through the mail. I don't have love letters because my dad didn't meet my mom till he came back from the war in 1945. And so they started dating and, and then they got engaged, but they didn't have much money. My dad brought back Japanese parachute from Japan. Made for war, yeah. repurposed for love. Mom was married in it and you never know what that parachute saw, if anything, but yeah, it's... What we do know... Amazing. ...is it saw the best side of humanity. There's other sides to war. Because if all is fair, you can take it with you. That silk just stayed just pure white, and my mom was a petite little thing, and, it, and uh, she just looked beautiful in it. The Warhawk Air Museum has a full Valentine's Day display set up. It includes more of those love letters, and there's plenty to keep you busy if you have an inch to dig deep into that collection. But that parachute dress, Brian, yeah. is kind of in a centered display. Right. Pretty darn cool. That is very cool. I think it's the tidbits about those letters that are most telling and that you can kind of, as you can see, made him emotional just to feel yeah. like, feels more real to hear and see the personalities come out in those letters. And there's like whole books of them. I mean, the one he was reading, we're trying to file through them. Hey, just read a few, just see a what random, you think yeah. of them. And he picked up a book and it was like one couple letters going back for wow. I mean, years, I'd imagine. So it kind of just tells a whole story of 
interesting chapter of a young man and young woman's life. All right. Yeah, those would be an interesting read, especially on a day like today or possibly the rest of this week. Thanks, It'll Andy. be up until the end of the weekend. Till the end of the weekend. So go check them out. All right. From love letters to, I don't know, a regular old letter about lost love or a possible lost love. We don't know. On this day, we've been tasked with reuniting or at least finding a young couple who today, I guess they could be in their 20s. It's a Valentine's Day mystery that began with a young girl's trip to a bookstore. A couple of weeks ago, we got a letter. Yes, a real handwritten letter from 17-year-old Riza, who wanted our help. You see, about a year ago, she bought a book from Half Price Books, a used bookstore in Meridian. It was a young adult novel, Just Listen, by Sarah Dessen. Inside, Riza found a strange bookmark, a strip of pictures. It appears to be a young couple, maybe in middle school, who slipped inside the cozy confines of a photo booth. The only other detail, the date on the back, June 20th, 2012. So Riza wonders if they're doing well and if they're maybe still together. But at the very least, she hopes this snapshot of a stolen kiss, a moment of love, won't remain lost. That this memory can be returned to its rightful owner. Okay, so here's the thing. Let's try to find these two people. The question is though, are they from the Treasure Valley? We're not sure. Are they even from Idaho? Who knows? Called the bookstore today. That'd be Half Price Books. It's a part of a chain of stores across the country, and they told me they get books sent to them from all over the country. So they admit it would be difficult to track where this book may have come from and these pictures that came with it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to post this story on our website at ktvb.com. So if you want to take a closer look at these pictures, maybe share it with some friends, family across the state or the country, well, maybe we can reunite this couple with these pictures. Let's give it a shot. Okay, now for something a little less virtuous, maybe. Valentine's Day is supposed to be a day when lovers express their affection for each other with gifts and maybe greeting cards. But as you know, there are other ways to express one's affection for another. So hold on to your hats. We're, ta we're about to talk about intimate relations. There's a fountain on the north side of City Hall that's been around since 1910. It's a drinking fountain put there by the local temperance union to keep thirsty people out of saloons. That was their intent because they believed drinking whiskey, well, that would lead to other forms of debauchery. And that's how you make the connection between one of Boise's oldest artifacts and one of its oldest professions. Hooker, harlot, lady of the evening. However, you refer to those who do it. I mean, they talk about, I believe, in biblical times, the Bible and... Prostitution hasn't been pegged as the oldest profession for nothing. No, right? In the beginning, Boise was benefiting from the gold rush. And whenever a boom town blossomed, well, the boom boom was not too far behind. No, I mean, because men, it was men, you know, men on the, the frontier, you know, that you always had more men than women. In 1863, 18% of the population were women in Boise. Back then, work for a pioneer woman was hard to find. Maybe a school marm, you know, you could be a seamstress, a washwoman, or a, uh, a housekeeper, essentially. There was acceptable and non-acceptable, and very little room for acceptable women to do anything else. As for the non-acceptable assignments, those started almost right away in the city of trees. You had the, a woman named Madame Mustache. She was tough. Her real name was Eleanor Dumont. She was a well-known traveling prostitute. She was really popular. In pictures, they tended to accentuate her famous features. She had a, a little bit of peach fuzz, but they took that and they like, they colored her mustache in more. Madame Moustache was also a gambler. And when winning wasn't in the cards, well, carnal knowledge was a way to recover her losses. She came in 1863, right from the beginning, and along 7th and Idaho Street, and then Idaho and 6th Street, you know, Garrison back then, because it went up to the fort. Um, that's where basically the first brothels uh, started up. And you would, we're talking about a tent with a saloon tent. And then in the back, you know, there'd be another, you know, tent, a big tent, and there would be somebody working. Soon, the search for gold in southern Idaho would go away, but the pursuit of passion would not. It just moved into more stable structures. I would say in the 1880s, it started to change. As the city started to develop with America, you get kind of like this lead up to uh, the Gilded Age, right? And that's when we see the rise of Davis Levy. And so he opens an establishment called the California Bakery, 
and it was on what is now the east side of City Hall. And, and he starts building um, these structures, you know, these tenement houses where City Hall is, kind of rough brick buildings. So Levy starts renting out the top floors of these buildings to women on the fringe of respectable society. You know, soiled doves, painted ladies, parlor women. He's like, there's money in this. And so he has offices on the top floor and these rooms for, for the, the prostitutes. And then on the bottom floor, he has more acceptable business, right? And by the 1890s, Boise, the new state capital, is now thriving, which meant men like Levy, miserly, dirty man who was really wealthy, had to keep up with demand by adding smaller, less glamorous abodes behind his buildings, wooden shacks called cribs. It was a much different life than the, you know, younger, uh, prettier, you know, women in the parlor houses. Uh, dirty, uh, vice-ridden, diseased, um, immoral. It was a wickedness that was well known and illegal, but left alone. Until another entity emerged, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Well-to-do to wealthy women, and they want to clean up their town. And so they want to rid the town of prostitution, which until that point had been really Idaho Street from 5th Street all the way down to 8th. Purging prostitution entirely would be almost impossible. So instead, they settled for consolidating it to one city block. And they're like, well, we can condense this into the alleys and on the upstairs of these rooms, and that's where we're gonna have it. Meaning where City Hall now stands was once the center of where some would lie with others. Yeah, in the 1890s, they called it White Chapel after London's White Chapel. Um, they also called it the Tenderloin, uh, you know, after Chicago's Tenderloin District. But it was also known as Levy's Alley. Yeah, people didn't like him. He rubbed people the wrong way. That is, until his untimely death. In October of 1901, they find his body in room number 13 in his main house, which was on the north side of Maine, where south side of City Hall is. Basically, Davis Levy was hit over the head one night and strangled with uh, kind of packing twine, really strong but thin stuff. And then he was placed in his bed with a towel and a pillow on top of the towel over his face. Would that be the conclusion of concubines in Boise? Not exactly. It always morphs. It changes. Historian Mark Iverson says business. I know that the Smith building, or the Smith block definitely had um, sex workers in it. Just moved into buildings you might recognize today. Like the Olympic above Mulligan's Bar. That was the Clyde rooming house at one point, and it was, there were boarding houses. There's a lot of heavy evidence that those were brothels. And across the street, the Avery, which used to be the Manitou Hotel. That was a brothel. The Chan Lee building where Flying M is, uh, that's, that definitely was a brothel. So the next time you order a brew, hot or cold, just know you're likely on the bottom of one of Boise's original brothels. I don't, I don't know what's going on now, but you know, it always seems to be with us in some capacity. Mark told us brothels, those houses of ill repute, could be traced all the way through the 1970s in Boise, but by then, most of them had moved to the Boise bench, you know, in the Orchard Emerald area. That bronze temperance fountain we mentioned at the beginning of the story, it was dedicated to Mary Tolls. It is still on the Boise City Hall grounds, and although it's recently been moved to higher ground appropriately, it is the only such fountain left in town, and it remains a reminder of the city's anti-saloon and anti-prostitution crusade.
someone who may not be able to do it on their own feels a little more comforted knowing that they can bring their loved one with them and they can have this experience together because oftentimes experiences are better when shared. Shared experiences are better, you know, like dancing or singing Islands in the Stream at karaoke or eating spaghetti like Lady in the Tramp. Growing up in the dirt and clay on a potato farm in southern Idaho, Shea Woodhouse had dreams of opening her own pottery studio. Well, that dream became a reality when almost three years ago, Shea opened up Clay Collective on State Street in Boise, and now she's turned her love of pottery into a potential love story for others. Photojournalist John Mark Crum takes us to date night at the Clay Collective. I love love. I, I say that a lot. I love seeing people love each other. Do you remember when we fell in love? This is date night. Thank you. Welcome to date night. It's basically Valentine's Day every Friday in here. <laughs> so we're working with a speckled stoneware. We wanted to have a fun little date. We have two kids and it's kind of hard to get out. Day night started when I opened Clay Collective. Half that ball into the shape of a potato. So I've been working with Clay for 16 years. Whenever anyone is like, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a potter, or I work with Clay. People automatically, the first thing they say is, like ghost? And there's the scene in the movie Patrick Swayze, I, it comes in behind her and puts his hands on her hands and helps her to make this piece that's actually collapsing the whole time. <laughs> I hope it wasn't a masterpiece. But they're together in this really intimate moment with their hands all dirty on top of each other and it's very like, it's a sexy scene. And it's iconic for people. Creating a ghost-like atmosphere for people is Relatable, comical, it's cute. It's fun to, yeah. you know, do something out of the norm. But sometimes we'll have two friends going on a date together. We'll have a mom and a daughter going on a date together. I didn't know what we were doing or where we were going, <laughs> but he knew. Like we both tried to friend zone each other, but it just like never really worked, so. Exactly. I think we both realized like, I don't know, our lives were a lot better when we were actually like talking and hanging out. Yeah. Oh shoot, oh, there he is. Witnessing hundreds of people on a date. Happy little mistake. I just love it when I see couples laugh together. <laughs> if you can find someone who you're comfortable being vulnerable around and you can laugh through something that's uncomfortable, that's pretty special and um, irreplaceable even. Yeah, just... <laughs> My main mission is to help people feel good. Feel good about themselves. Feel better about themselves. Feel confident within themselves. Kind of why I open my doors to people. The Righteous Brothers, come on now. This is the song. Happy Valentine's Day. Well, as you heard Shay say, date night is every Friday throughout the year, but there's a date night marathon starting tonight. It lasts through the rest of the week in honor of Valentine's Day. There's only one class left this Sunday coming up at 6. The rest of the week sold out, so it's pretty popular, but you can enjoy, as I said, every other Friday throughout the rest of the year. Shay says you don't need to be creative at all to experience all that she has to offer.
really hoping that the weather tonight won't be putting a damper on any of your Valentine's Day plans. We've got soggy, we've got snowy out there, but the good news, I guess, for valley locations, unless you really like snow, is that the snow is confined to some of those mountain areas right now. But overall, it's going to be a wet, chilly evening, so probably a good idea to bring a waterproof layer and an extra warm layer because once the humidities go up with the, re the rainy conditions, that makes it feel colder for us as well. So again, I've mentioned that it's going to be valley rain and mountain snow as that snow is confined to the higher elevations. And the snow has started out a little bit slow for us, say that three times fast, uh, but those accumulations roughly look about a half inch to an inch at some of those ski areas uh, for the past few hours or so. Overall, when we're talking about the next 48 hours or so, that valley rain is sticking in the picture. Moderate accumulation is expected, so not, a, not quite a drizzle, but enough to make some puddles for you. But in the mountains, that's where we're expecting a little bit more of those weather impacts because we see are expecting those higher accumulations towards the West Central Mountains, Boise Mountains, and Long Valley. And then also, as we consider that, it could be mean for some tricky mountain travel when the snow really starts getting going on Highway 51, Highway 55, and Highway 21. And especially when we combine that with the winds and the the wind, the snow starts to blow over the highways. Here's where some of those showers are right now. You can see that those rainy conditions through those valley areas, we've got lots of greens and the snow is starting to move in some of those mountain areas. So when we talk about the snow through Friday morning, here's what we're looking at. You can see uh, up to a foot is expected over in Stanley, but again, a lot more of those West Central Mountains and the Long Valley areas are going to be favored initially. So as we go throughout the rest of tonight, just know that we're expecting those wet conditions to continue and snow for the mountains over as well. Overall, things in your seven day forecast are looking a little bit more on the mild side, but also a little bit wetter.
All right, let's get to your comments on this Valentine's Day. A couple people had some issues with the story selection that we had for today, like this one from Deborah. 73 years, Idaho native. Seriously, I enjoy your Idaho historical reports. Yes, even report on Boise's historical brothels. But why share this story on Valentine's Day? I'm disappointed. That followed up by this one. Prostitution has nothing to do with love. Shame on you for showing this story on Valentine's Day. Says Lori from Boise. I challenge you to, to give us a different day that we could show a story like this. We thought it related because... As it's been pointed out to us several times, many people fall in love with prostitutes. I think there's, what, uh, Doc Holliday, there's Wyatt Earp, just to name a couple, but it's a possibility, and love is love, and if things happen, and we can't find a better day to do a story like this on, so we did. Amy says she still has letters her husband, her hubby and her wrote to each other before they got hitched. They've been married for 29 and a half years, so congratulations to them. Too bad Valentine's Day only comes once a year because I really love your sport coat. P.S. Today is my 50th, 54th wedding anniversary. Congratulations, Pat. And yes, it is the one day a year I can wear this coat, and I'm glad to do it, but you won't see it for another 364. It's a leap year, 365 days possibly next year. We'll see you back here tomorrow, though.